let's go to you guys out in the audience. If you could uh, tell us uh, who you are and who you're representing as well, please. Um, and we have a microphone, of course. Rob. Thank you, Chairman. Tom Ferris, member of the Institute. Two points, two words. First one, in relation to the second recommendation, if I was drafting it, I would insert the word investment in public transport, because there's a potential conflict there. It is only broad transport, more investment in the roads, and missing on climate change targets. Second one is back to Paul. Delighted to hear his point about impact assessment. He mentioned some of the areas, and I would add a word, the regulatory impact assessment, because it has gone on a little silent in some areas. And Thanks for that, Tom. We'll we take two more questions, if we could, up the top um, with uh, Tim and Sean over this side. There we go. Maybe, Paul, while we're getting the mic up, you might want to respond to some of that on the regulatory impact. Um, yeah, I think it's a bro the broader area of impact assessment, I think, obviously, is an area which needs to be looked at. I think it's, it's the effectiveness of the process, because there is impact assessment in place. It's, it's a, how effective a lot of it has been, I think, is the, is the question. Hmm. Take the questions now again. Uh, Tim. Tim, Tim Callum, yes, all right. Um, I'm just puzzled at how the Commission and the recommendations frame the household jobless issue. Uh, Ireland's household jobless rate, just before the recession, was uh, around the EU 15 average. In uh, 2012, it was five points above the EU average, and, and naturally enough, the Commission picked on, picked on this and, and uh, The latest numbers say it's one point above the EU 15 average, and that was 2016, and the one has come down again. I think we're back in the same sort of normal territory. Uh, so to see this high level of the CSR is slightly mm -hmm. strange. Mm -hmm. Unless the rest have gotten worse, Sean. Can you just identify yourself, please? The uh, Social Power Forum has identified growth in the inequality as the key uh, risk factor in, in across the world that has, it has taken over from climate change. And I think that that doesn't figure su sufficiently here. The second issue is you're very strong about how good Ireland is doing unemployment. I would si simply point out to you that an awful lot of that employment is precarious, it's low pay, there's a lot of people who are currently living in poverty with an actual job and so on. Uh, that goes partly as well to your Europe 2020 strategy, I see from your profile you were a part of that. Much, with the exception of education, Ireland is doing very poorly on the 2020 strategy targets. And I think that, that needs to be, I, I did that one final thing, uh, social housing will not be built in Ireland if we're depending on private finance. Under any circumstance in the next decade or decade and a half, we have uh, all sorts of issues that have to be dealt with, but I think the idea that in some way or other we're going to deal with social housing by private, by, by private money is completely that. We need the investment, and it has to come from the public side, it can be taken off books and things of that nature, but it has to be public. Okay, thanks. That was Sean Healy from Social Justice. Uh, Michelle, uh, specific points to you, I guess. Um, thank you very much. Uh, if I may, uh, just um, starting by impact assessment, I just want to support what has been said. Uh, we believe in the Commission that this is absolutely essential. We need good evaluations of government policies. We need regular evaluations of government policies. And when new policies are developed, we need impact assessment. So you look at cost and benefits of policies, but also regulatory impact assessment, basically designed to choose what is the best regulatory intervention. We are trying uh, to develop this at EU level with some success, I would say. But this is hard work. Huh, to be uh, So it takes time. It takes uh, a special expertise, but I really stress this point. It is absolutely uh, fundamental. Um, I just want maybe to come to the point about jobless households. Um, for me, it's also linked with something Paul said about uh, the integrated package of policies needed uh, for activation. Actually, what I understand is that in Ireland, you have jobless households, you have long-term unemployed, uh, you have people with disabilities, so you have a part of the population which is in the margin. And what cannot happen is um, a return to economic performance and leave these people in the margins. You if you want to have uh, a sustainable prosperity, you need to make sure that those people as well are included in the labor market. And so our advice 
is actually to have an activation policy which is integrating the different elements the skills issues, with the social issues, with the health issues, all together. And we have made some um, proposals on contribution in this uh, respect. Um, one aspect for us is not only that um, the education services or the education system talks to the social services and to the public employment service, it's also that uh, the population concerned, the persons concerned, feel that they have one interlocutor that they are not speaking to uh, 10 different faceless administrations, but there is a real integration that they feel that they have uh, somebody in front of them who understands their issues altogether. Because if you want to help um, somebody in this kind of, or a family in this situation uh, to get back to employment, you have to resolve the social issues at the same time as the employment issues. They cannot be disconnected. So this is uh, basically an expa a short explanation on this point. I agree the, the point was made about uh, putting more emphasis on inequalities. We have tried uh, this year in this package to do it, but I, I, I take uh, very much your remark um, as, a, um, as a point about the importance of keeping that as a priority. And uh, our intention is to actually reinforce uh, the priority on dealing with inequalities in our future recommendations uh, um, next year in particular. Yeah, maybe I'll stop here. Sure, uh, Romini, do you wanna respond to any of those questions as well? Uh, or Paul? Mm -hmm. Feel free to jump in if you do. Otherwise, yeah? No. no. no? Right, otherwise we go back to the floor over here. Two, two speakers. So I'm Mark Ferguson, I'm the Director of General Science Foundation Ireland, and also the Chief Scientific Advisor to the government. I would welcome recommendations, thank you very much, recommendations uh, 13 and 14, particularly looking at investment on research and innovation. It's very important that Ireland does better in market creating innovation. That's going to be the key for job success. And net net new technologies create more jobs than they destroy, but as you've said, they displace a large number of people. And we need to be better at continuous lifelong learning, which almost nobody has done well. So I would love I welcome both of those recommendations. And uh, lady behind, uh, just there as well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Simon Shay. I'm a consultant, and I work for um, different clients in the Gulf region. And my question is very uh, separate than the recommendations because I see there's a gap about refugees who came to Ireland and uh, experienced the gap. How we can integrate them to the labour market? <coughs> like at the moment, you you see them in the uh, really at the reception and. Sorry, the integration agency, Department of Justice. They try to integrate them to the society by getting them training, by getting them to know the uh, system, how to get trained, how to get jobs. Is there a place for them in the recommendation for Ireland? Thank you. And maybe if you sprint quickly, there's a gentleman over this side who had his hand up uh, fast. Uh, but that, of course, that uh, refugee uh, issue integration question for right across Europe, I think, not uh, not in any way uh, particular to Ireland, sir. Uh, Niall Walsh, member of the Institute. Uh, Michelle, I was very interested to hear you mention the EU pillar on social rights. Could I just say a few things about people with disabilities? Because Ireland is still refusing stubbornly to ratify the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And although the European Union has ratified the convention, there is tremendous resistance at council level and in the commission to its proper implementation. Now the core of this convention has to do with accessibility of the built environment. And this is atrocious all around Europe, not just in Ireland, all around Europe. And this represents a tremendous physical barrier to employing people with disabilities. And this issue has not been raised at all in this discussion. Thank you. Um, well, Michel, a few issues there too. I mean, on the CRPD, the convention, the UN Convention on the, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, I even myself do not understand why Ireland has not ratified. Um, that's very strange, actually. The only member state who, have, who has not ratified. Why? But maybe somebody can, can uh, enlighten me. <laughs> because frankly, there is no reason to, send, to stand outside. <coughs> Uh, this uh, convention. 
And uh, indeed, you said uh, quite rightly that the EU itself has ratified the convention, and uh, we are doing everything we can to make sure it is properly implemented. It takes time. Um, for instance, we have uh, made a proposal, which is now in discussion in the Council, on uh, what we call the Accessibility Act, which is for key products and services which are uh, available on the single market to make sure that they contain accessibility requirements which are the same in the 28 member states. It's really extremely important for transport, for computers, uh, for audiovisual services to make sure that the accessibility requirements are the same so that uh, people with disabilities can use these services and the products in the same way in different member states. And also it's good for business because it means that the same st standards will apply across uh, the single market. So for the time being, we were hoping to get a, a, a general approach on this in the Council uh, in the month of June. It has not proven possible yet, but it's clear that uh, in the coming months, uh, we will work with the presidency uh, to make sure that we have an agreement. Actually, this proposal is um, one of the few priorities which the three institutions agreed for 2017, meaning that uh, Parliament, Council, and Commission agreed that there should be a conclusion on this legislative file in 2017. So it's clear that for the Commission, it is a priority. We are working on it, and I hope Member States will follow us on uh, this proposal, because people with disabilities actually, uh, we made uh, some uh, impact. We made an impact assessment when we uh, prepared the proposal. You have 80 million people inside the European Union who have disabilities, but when you look at uh, people who have temporary disabilities, this is a much larger population, and so it, it is really important that we take better into account. Uh, uh, the rights of persons with disabilities. And um, to be also uh, uh, maybe more clear on this, we have obligations vis-a-vis -vis the UN. In June, actually in two weeks, our performance, how we implement well or badly the, this convention will be examined by the, by the UN Secretariat. So it is a process in which we have every reason uh, to, be performing, uh, to be performing well. Investment in research and development and innovation, I fully agree uh, that this is going to be a priority. Um, how the job market is evolving means that we need more innovation, we need more skills. The two things are linked. Uh, it's clear that we are not in an economy where we compete on low wages. We are in an economy where our competitiveness depends on innovation and the skills of the workforce. And so this, for this reason alone, I think it's really crucial for Ireland to invest more in research and development. Rowena, you wanted to say something I about did, the yeah. R&D piece as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, to just to pick up on that innovation piece, it's actually very interesting when you read what the Commission had to say, particularly about smaller companies, and they said that you know, there seemed to be an over-focus on the research and development tax credits, which larger companies use, and more targeted policy mixes with more direct funding might better address the needs of Irish young and innovative firms, and I think that, that, that was well worth noting. One thing that um, uh, struck me in, in reading that as well was the... Uh, the need for innovation that is arising sheerly from the fact that the UK decided to leave the EU 12 months ago um, because there's a new an innovation required now for companies to actually start to think about where may they be selling their products and services into the future. And with that in mind, I think some of the um, measures that the government have already started to put in place uh, through Enterprise Ireland, through only two days ago the announcement about the support for really small companies uh, through the local enterprise offices is hugely important. People have to actually... Now, I don't know where we're going to put 270,000 tonnes of Irish beef, genuinely. I mean, we really do need to try and have as our first outcome still being able to put it into the UK. But at the same time, I think um, innovation generally has had one meaning, but I think in the context now of this changed environment uh, that we're going to be trading in, uh, innovation resources are actually going to have to be put into companies who may do what they're doing quite well at the moment, but may need to start innovating as to who they're now going to sell it to into the future. Paul, if you want to come back on some of those as well. Yeah, um, I suppose it's vitally focused on the issue of uh, jobs and access to quality jobs uh, as a response to poverty, but 
in, this, in addressing poverty, it must be, as I said, a holistic approach. So it's obviously around access to a decent income, whether in or out of work, access to quality services, and we, a number have been mentioned, including within communities, and uh, I mentioned healthcare as well, and uh, health outcomes, and then access to quality jobs uh, is extremely important. And just in terms of um, inequality, as we mentioned earlier, and one of the issues of things that's been highlighted by uh, the government and by the Commission is that Ireland is probably one of the most effective countries in reducing poverty levels and inequality through social transfers. But it also kind of is because Ireland is one of the most unequal in society, at the highest level of inequality and poverty before transfers. And a lot of that relates to pay and to work and so on. So I think we need to get under the hood and try to understand why Ireland is so unequal, uh, has such levels of inequality before social transfers. Um, and just one final thing in terms of migrants and so access to um, work and so on. It has to be also, I suppose, social integration and integration to the labour market. I think the finding of the Supreme Court in relation to um, asylum seekers' right to work, I think, is very important this week. Ireland uh, has not signed up to the reception directive, the EU reception directive. So while most other countries, apart from Ireland and Lithuania, uh, allow migrant workers to work in this country after a certain period, in the countries of a certain period of time, Ireland doesn't. And I think that's something now we need to go back and look at. We have uh, five minutes to our uh, allotted time. Let's go to another round, um, starting here and lady up in the middle there. Thank you. Uh, I'm the director of your family, a new agency based in, in Ireland, but working very closely with, uh, with the Commission of the, the Environment and the National Power of the Commission. Uh, my question is around the, the public services because um, that's something that we study in our cooperative uh, research access, uh, affordability, um, quality. And, um, and mentioned before, uh, there's no mention of the recommendation to the health, but it is in the in the in the report. And that's one of the areas where we found uh, paradoxically that while Ireland it is investing more than the average uh, uh, of the European Union, the outcomes in terms of uh, access and affordability are lower. And that's uh, if you compare that maybe with other services like education where uh, Ireland offers much more public. Thank you for that, Pablo. And lady up there in the <coughs> middle of the hall. And one more if there is. Anybody? Thank you very much, Ray. Well, I'm going to accept you. Just a number of points I want to ask. Um, you talked about social dialogue being one of the strengths of the recovery. Um, and you also then, on the other hand, talked about flat uh, rate that was applies for the tourist industry. And I suppose it's just important to raise this, uh, this forum that that that, that rate is in place, notwithstanding the fact that the hotels and federation refuses to engage in collective bargaining with trade unions on wages. So we have a real contradiction there. And in, in, in um, the public service as well, we, we're not so sure that, that, uh, that um, social dialogue is going to, is going to actually see, see us through. Because this, um, this, uh, this set of recommendations doesn't really point to the role of, of, of wages in, in the recovery. And uh, Paul, Paul Gunnell spoke about it as well, the issue of precarious work. And we, we know very much that uh, through the gig economy, the rise of the gig economy now, um, and various forms of precarious work, that low pay is a real issue in the Irish economy, particularly in the hotel sector, for instance. Uh, and it affects women primarily to a very, very uh, large extent. Uh, so childcare is not just the only issue for women's participation, it's also the, the problem of precarious work. And just um, lastly, it's a little bit disappointing in the, in that, that we don't really have a preparedness around uh, Brexit in terms of the recommendations that are coming down. There are very, very vulnerable sectors, the food industry is a vulnerable sector. Uh, the, the Commission has tools at its disposal in terms of the globalization fund, for instance. We need to be looking at those areas and we need to be much more proactive, particularly as Ireland will be one of the most affected economies in, in, in Europe on all of those things. Thank you for that. Let's start uh, closing it up. And we'll start with you, Paul. Uh, you might want to respond to that, particularly on, on the pay issue, which I think is, is uh, quite interesting. And we'll have exchequer returns later today, so we'll be looking at the in uh, income tax returns see if that uh, is starting to manifest itself as an issue. Yeah, I, I, I suppose that, as we mentioned quite a bit in terms of the issue of pay and the issue of precarious work and the, um, 
a living wage, I suppose, in a sense of ensuring that people who are working can take home uh, decent pay. So it's not just about the hourly rate, it's about the, what people have in their pocket at the end of the week to spend. Um, and there's certain uh, issues around that, the level of in-work poverty. So when we're talking about um, lower intensity households, jobless households, or moving people who are unemployed into employment, it's also important to look at the types of jobs that are there and the supports that people need to get a, a decent job. Uh, so I think there might be some issues looking at legislation. I think I've heard proposals in relation to legislation to deal with some issues around precarious work, but this is an area that's going to take a lot more uh, focus. Rowena. Okay, thanks. Uh, just to pick up on the last point that Lorraine made, Lorraine, I couldn't agree with you more. I actually thought it was a bit like you know Harry Potter and Voldemort that Brexit couldn't be mentioned in the country-specific recommendations. Um, there was references to external shocks, but no reference to Brexit. It ties in a small bit, I suppose, with the experience that we've had up until this point, that we've been told repeatedly in Europe that Brexit hasn't happened yet. Therefore, when we were trying to get people to engage on it, it's not happening. But I think the, 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 uh, I think the point that you make is it is our responsibility to take the recommendations or our government's responsibility and to utilise them to address Brexit-specific issues. I mentioned earlier the innovation piece that I think is, it can be taken from this and, and used positively and uh, effectively and I think uh, next year's country specific recommendations would be severely lacking if they don't actually make greater and more explicit reference to the impact of Brexit and, 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 and how it could impact or will impact on, on our, our economic structures and our, our public finances. Thank you. Uh, maybe they don't write, make recommendations because Brexit isn't a, an EU or a national policy. But on the other hand, it's so, so serious. Do we need to wait for these guys to tell us what to do? We should be uh, doing something ourselves. Um, Michel, do you want to uh, pick up on those last few points? I think uh, you're right. We sh you should not wait for us to uh, tell you what to do on Brexit, for sure. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, uh, when we prepared uh, this set of recommendations, we thought uh, carefully about what to say on Brexit. And uh, finally, we decided to say nothing. Because, and I'm, I'm just telling you what um, also our president thinks. Our president thinks that Brexit should not dictate the European agenda. The European agenda is about coming together. We have to define now the new mission statement of a European, of a European Union of 27 member states. This is it. This is not about Brexit. We have to... Uh, negotiates the divorce settlement, but we need first and foremost to think about us, us the 27. So this is why these recommendations do not talk about Brexit. This being said, we are dealing with Brexit, and Michel Barnier came to Dublin to explain what we are doing. And I can tell you that we have uh, in these negotiations uh, the European interest and the Irish interest very much at heart. You have seen the negotiating directives, they are quite clear yeah, in what we want. So uh, this is just an explanation, if I, if I may. And um, I just want to say, because I forgot to reply to the point on the integration of uh, refugees, this is a problem which is happening um, in several member states. And uh, there are some excellent examples, good practices, in particular in Sweden and uh, Germany, of measures which have been uh, developed on the spot. And it's really, uh, I would say, learning by doing almost. Um, things which are really working to help the refugees and their families, in particular to be integrated in the labor market quite quickly. They have some uh, language programs, also some jobs that do not require a full uh, proficiency in the language. Um, and this, I think I recommend, and maybe we can help you also to look at these good practices, uh, because I think this is what is working. So instead of receiving a recommendation from Brussels, sometimes it's uh, simply good that we show uh, the good things which are done in another member state. And I stop here. That's great, Michelle. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it is true to say that comparisons with other countries' practices are, are very valuable, and also just from a media point of view, uh, the folks who watch television just love to see what's going on in other countries uh, and how they've addressed uh, issues there. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance here today. We've got a lot to think about um, in a fairly short paper, but well worth a read and well worth focusing our thoughts on to do with fiscal peace, investment, jobs, growth, equality, and all that. I suspect a lot of it is tied together by one horrible three-letter word, tax, uh, and that's something we're going to have to think about uh, a lot as well. I'd like to thank uh, Michelle, Rowena, and Paul uh, for being our speakers here today, and thank you for attending. Thank you all.